Crypto Covering, my name is Stephen Benoon. You're watching Israeli News Live here on World Harvest Television Network and delighted to be here with you in this two-part series about the Chaldeans. And I'm sure there are many of you that have all types of ideas and thoughts as far as who are the Chaldeans. And of course, we know from the book of Jeremiah, chapter 50, chapter 51, Babylon and the Chaldeans are one and the same. Not so much the same, but mentioned as if they're together. We look at Daniel's prophecy. We see once again the Chaldeans among, uh, amongst the uh, ne uh, Babylonian Empire, Nebuchadnezzar's basically his military arm. Uh, and so I really wanted to get into the subject mainly because of some incredible insights that the Lord has revealed to my heart recently from the book of Habakkuk. Uh, and I'm sure it's going to be a blessing to you and I don't want to waste any time. It is two-part series here uh, for those watching on World Harvest Television Network. If you're not catching it on World Harvest Television Network, let me encourage you Definitely, you want to go look up our website, IsraeliNewsLive.org. We always have a history of videos that are coming out that are on our YouTube channel. And I know that'll be a blessing to you. And of course, you can normally see this video in its entirety on our YouTube channel called Israeli News Live or even Danoon Institute, our biblical channel. My wife also has a channel called Rise Up Children of God. She really does need your prayers tr tremendously bad. We've really been battling a very serious sickness with her uh, recently there. And so we just covet your prayers. Just want to mention that briefly here uh, today as well. Uh, but let's get right into the message. I want to start with Jeremiah chapter 50. And as I stated earlier, we know that uh, Dudamon had prophesied about Babylon and from the things that he had seen by vision, from what I understand, he believed that Babylon was the United States. And although I do agree with this in part, I have to say I think that Babylon and the Chaldeans, it's a much bigger, uh, much bigger event than what we realize there. And we are definitely on the verge of an apocalypse as a result of this. And so there are many things that I agree with him on uh, regarding this. But I want to kind of break it down and separate it because it seems through biblical times, there's always been a separation, but working together. So let's get right into it. My people have been lost sheep. Their shepherds have caused them to go astray. They have turned them away on the mountains. They have gone from mountain to hill. They have forgotten their resting place. All that found them have devoured them. Their adversary said, we are not guilty because they have sinned against the Lord. The Lord, uh, excuse me, the habitation of justice, even the Lord, the hope of their fathers. Now, just for a second, before I go any further, that is something that is so obvious in history. Now, notice, though, in Jeremiah chapter 50, even though we may look at this as a future event, this is clearly identifying what has happened to the children of Israel, not just the house of Judah or the house of Israel, but both houses have been hunted down and have been destroyed uh, as, as a people everywhere they've gone. And many times, even amongst the Christians or so-called Christians, they have, as the Bible says, they think to kill you thinking they do God a service. And we have seen this happen, whether it be the pogroms, whether it be the Inquisition uh, that the Vatican did from the 12th century up to, to the uh, 18th century, whether we be, be in the case of Adolf Hitler and what he was doing, all of these different leaders thinking they're doing God a service to kill the Jews. And it says right here, found them, uh, have devoured them. See, right there, have devoured them. And their adversary said, we are not guilty because they have sinned against the Lord. They've, they're Christ killers is what we get called. And I say we because I am a Jew. Although I am a believing Jew in the Yeshua as the Mashiach, I'm still a Jew by birth, both my father whether he realized it or not, was Jewish, and my mother as well. And my mother did know. Her family did know that they were Jews. They were just non-practicing Jews. So very interesting to look at this. Now, as we go on down in chapter 50, let's look at what it says here. Flee out of the midst of Babylon and go forth out of the land of the Chaldeans and be as he goats before the flocks. For lo, I will stir up and cause to come up against Babylon an assembly of great nations from, from the north country, and they shall set themselves in array against her. From thence she shall be taken. Their arrows shall be as of a mighty man that maketh childless. None shall return in vain. Now, if you notice, the Babylonians and the Chaldeans are 
again, separate, even in Jeremiah's uh, prophecies here in chapter 50, even in chapter 51. They're referred to not as the self-same people there, uh, just like it was in the time of Daniel, but they're referred to, the Chaldeans are, are basically, in this case here, the military arm of Babylon, as it was in the time of, guess what, in the time of Daniel. If you remember back during the Babylonian Empire and Nebuchadnezzar, when Nebuchadnezzar had sent, it was the house of Judah at this time, they were going to go 70 years into captivity. Jeremiah kept prophesying to them, when they come, surrender. Just surrender and don't fight. Those of you that fight, you will sur surely die. This actually happens. Who is it that comes for the king of Babylon? It's the Chaldeans. The Chaldeans come and take Jerusalem and they take the inhabitants of, uh, of Jerusalem and they go into captivity and there they're there for 70 years. Daniel was among the, uh, those that went into captivity and of course as we know he uh, prophesies many things uh, before the king, uh, the king Nebuchadnezzar and even his son later uh, as time goes on. We're going to get into that in just a moment here. Uh, but I want to just kind of set that stage for you showing you how that Babylon and the Chaldeans are not the same people, but a military arm for Babylon. Let's, look at, let's go back in the time of Daniel then and take a look at what was going on in Daniel's time to kind of get an idea about this. Chapter 3, Wherefore at that time certain Chaldeans came near and brought accusation against the Jews. They spoke and said, Nebuchadnezzar the king, O king, live forever. Thou, king, hast made a decree that every man that shall hear the sound of the horn, the pipe, the harp, the trigon, psaltery, and the bagpipe, and all kinds of music shall fall down and worship the golden image. Now, I'm just wanting to set a stage here before I go further into the reading of Daniel here. As we already know, what happens? In the time when Nebuchadnezzar was king, uh, Daniel in his uh, in uh, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, as we normally call them, they are there in the empire. There has been all kinds of chaos that, that has happened. D uh, Nebuchadnezzar has had some incredible dreams there. The Chaldeans are unable to interpret his dreams. Neither the magicians or astrologers, any of these, are, are, none of them are able to interpret what Nebuchadnezzar is seeing. In fact, he makes it very difficult in the beginning because he doesn't even tell the dream. The dream flees him. And so he demands of them to tell him his dream and the interpretation or die. Well, it doesn't go over very well uh, with, with the magicians or the Chaldeans or the astrologers and they're all scared to death. But Daniel comes up and Daniel, by God's grace, knows because it's revealed to him what the king's dream actually is. So, I mean, that's if you want to know how to do a real true interpretation of a dream, you don't, don't even tell your dream to the person that claims to have the interpretation. Tell them you tell me the dream and then I'll know you'll have the correct interpretation. That is a true interpreter of dreams there. Uh, so I kind of like that there. And, and what happens here is then, you know, of course, the king makes this decree here. And, uh, and now, uh, the Chaldeans are the ones bringing the accusation against the Jews because they're not coming and worshiping before uh, the image, before the thing that the, that the king has made there. Very interesting to see this. And uh, so I want to just share that with you. And as we're going to go a little deeper onto this, I want to go into this a little deeper before I share more about this. So let's move on down to verse 11 here. And whosoever falleth not down in worship shall be cast into the midst of a burning fiery furnace. There are certain Jews whom thou hast appointed over the affairs of the province of Babylon, Shadrach, Meshach, Abednego. These men, O king, have not regarded thee. They serve not thy gods, nor worship the golden image which thou hast set up. Well, of course not. Can't say as I blame them. But I want you to notice something that I think is very important about this. Because what happens in the past is a reflection of what happens in the future. Because you have to remember, in the book of Revelation, we read about mystery Babylon. So there is a modern day Babylon today, and there is a Chaldean today that is also a military arm for mystery Babylon today. And if that be the case, then there must be Jews that are dispersed today, as it was then, and they must be over certain areas of the province, as it was in the time of Daniel. In fact, if we go back 
during uh, the time before the creation of the state of Israel in 1948, which some say it's 1948. I actually differ with that. I say that Israel was created a nation back in the mid-1800s when the Ottoman Empire allowed the Jews to come and repurchase land inside their homeland, their ancestral homeland. That is when Israel really truly began, began to be a nation. And they were doing it according to the way that Abraham, our forefather, had done it to start with. Abraham never allowed anybody to give him the land. He purchased whatever land that he bought inside uh, modern day or, or the ancient the ancient Israelite uh, area there, like in the case of Hebron. So. Going into that issue there, as we see in the case of Daniel, though, there were certain Jews, as the Chaldeans say, are being put over the province of Babylon, which was Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Now, these are their given names. It's not their real names that they actually have. They actually have Hebrew names. Uh, but uh, at this point, to save time, though, this is what they did. And the same thing was happening, even though the Jews have been into exile. And I say Jews, Hebrews, Israelites, we know is a better way of putting it because it's not just the house of Judah that's in exile, it's both house of Israel and house of Judah that are in exile. The entire Hebrew nation people that have been in exile, especially back during the time of World War II. And what did we see though amongst the Israelite community or the Jewish community, especially that in Europe and even in America, you know, they were over the province. Bankers, especially the Jewish people, were very much known as bankers. And if you are the banker, you control, a, you have a very powerful influence. Now, this is not a picture per se of the, you know, all the bankers there. But in this picture here on uh, monovisions.com, the man there at the head of the table is one of the chief bankers in the United States. Now, Germany also, before the war, before the Second World War, and even the First World War, the Jewish people in Germany were really given a preeminence there to be head of banks, head of businesses. They really controlled a lot of the financial institutions there. They were given a lot of liberties in Germany. Uh, and so therefore, like in the days of Daniel there, they were over the province, right? All right, so let's go back though and look again at Daniel 11, focusing on verse 12 though. There are certain Jews whom thou hast appointed over the affairs of the province of Babylon, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. These men, O king, have not regarded thee. They serve not thy gods, nor worship the golden image. So up until this time, even though there are Jews that are over the province, the Jewish people, and I say the Jewish people because in Europe and also in the United States, Typically, you would look at the house of, the house of Judah because the remnant of the house of Judah were still keeping according to Torah tradition. The house of Israel, many of them became believers. They assimilated amongst the, the cultures they were in. Uh, the United States, Europe, uh, many of those had become believers in Yeshua. Why? Because when Yeshua was here, what did he do? He said to his apostles, go only into the way of the lost, house sheep, the lost, uh, the lost sheep of the house of Israel. And there were many converts, Damascus, Syria, for example, as we've seen this war-torn nation and knowing in the prophecy of Isaiah 17, where it speaks about uh, Damascus being a ruinous heap, we also see that God never intended for that because it says the fortress shall cease from Ephraim when Damascus becomes a ruinous heap, which means what? It wasn't God's will that whoever's going to bomb and destroy Syria, Damascus there, it's not God's will. You're destroying the very fortress or the government that has protected the Christian people there. And out of two million Eastern Orthodox Christians, which is part of the house of Ephraim, not all, by the way, because Ephraim also spread into Europe. They spread into America. You know, the tribes have scattered all the world, including Russia, including Russia too. See, but they've spread everywhere. And the thing is, though, is when they come in here and we see this, um, uh, the situation there of, of you know, the, the Jewish people being there, you know, what happens? Well, as we already know, you know, they're, 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 they're just, they're destroyed regardless, you know, so they may be over the province and everything, but, but what happens there then comes the destruction. Now, in the case of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, they would not bow down to the king's demand to worship the image. And it's the same way with the Jews of today. The Jews of today, they kept, the, not like I said, not counting the ones that were there in Damascus, the, the, the children of Ephraim there and, and their descendants, you know, Two, two out of two million, by the way, and I kind of lost my thought for a second, out of two million, 1.4 million of those have been killed during the war that has been conducted against the Syrian government, which to me is an illegal war. In fact, uh, uh, Ms. Livni, 
who, uh, who ran against Prime Minister Netanyahu in elections uh, not too long ago, she actually was on RT News and stated when the, when the, the uh, announcer on RT asked her, you know, why didn't Israel join Russia to help defeat ISIS? And Ms. Livni got angry and she says, almost offended, she says, are you really suggesting that we would send Israeli soldiers in there to fight ISIS in Syria? Well, to me, yes, we should have. Have we forgotten that Syria is the homeland of our mothers of Israel? Both Leah and Rachel are what? Syrians. Did we forget the covenant that we, that we made with Laban, our forefather Jacob, who became Yisrael, Yaakov, Yisrael, made with uh, Laban? Are his father-in-law saying that I would do you no harm if you if you made this pile of rocks you do me no harm and, and if I if you cross over do you you know the words you don't neither one of them do each other harm now we know that neither one of them have kept the kept the agreement neither Israel nor Syria has kept the agreement they keep crossing back and forth but somewhere we got to make a stand and do the right thing and remember the covenant that we made with our forefather Laban because it's just a mess but anyway I really think that Ms. Livni should have said, you know what, we should. Israel should join with Russia to defeat ISIS, to defeat Al-Qaeda, Al-Nusra, because why? There were Jews living in Syria, not only Jews, but there are also the House of Israel, the two million Christians. These are descendants of Israel. Now, no doubt many of them Arabic as well that, that became believers uh, as, a, as a result of, the, of the, um, spreading the gospel throughout the, the Arabic nation there but many of them still of the house of Israel. So very, very tragic situation. Don't want to kind of get sidetracked there. We got a lot of ground to cover here. But anyway, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego are going to be thrown into the fiery furnace. And sadly enough, this is exactly what we see happening uh, in the case of, what is it? Babylonian influence with the Chaldeans throughout World War II. And in the case of this here, you know, we know that there's a lot of debate whether or not Pope Pius XII was involved uh, with Adolf Hitler during the Second World War. But to me, the evidence does seem to be clear that it does point to the fact that he was involved. Now, I know that he tried to, maybe they tried to be covered up, and there's been a lot of apologetics written on his behalf since then. But nonetheless, Rome has been heavily involved in uh, what happened during World War II. And of course, as a result, as a result there, the ovens were there, the Jews were thrown into the ovens, they were burned. I had many family members that were killed during the Holocaust as well. And the Chaldeans in this case here is Adolf Hitler's military, the military wing doing the, the fighting for what the Roman command would actually pass down. And it's not changed any, it's still the same even to this day. So let's move on. We go, go back into, uh, we go to verse uh, eight in chapter 50 and we read here. Flee out of the midst of Babylon and go forth out of the land of the Chaldeans and be as the he goes before the flocks. For lo, I will stir up and cause to come up against Babylon an assembly of great nations from the north country. And they shall set themselves in array against her. From thence she shall be taken. Their arrows shall be as of a mighty man that maketh childless. None shall return in vain. Now friends, this is amazing to me when we begin to look at the pr prophecy, the prophetic side of this, you know. It comes up against Babylon, a symbol of great nations from the north country. That can be none other than Russia. And it says the assembly of nations, it has to be Russia, Iran, maybe China. I can't say all who, who would actually join with Russia on this. And this is where I say Dudamon is actually right. But what is he coming against? They're coming against who? Babylon and assembly of great nations. But Babylon is represented also of her military force. It's not just Rome, but Babylon has been running a military force. And I think that that military force is not just the United States, but it's NATO in particularly. So, Maybe not every country that is a NATO country will be a target, but clearly what we see, the alliance that has been happening uh, in, through NATO and throughout all of Europe, along with the United States and the alliance, whether it be Australia, Europe, uh, France, Germany, England, 
Norway, Sweden, Latvia, Estonia, Lithuania, and some of these are not even NATO members, but they have been joining right along with NATO in this fight against Russia, this push against Russia from the very beginning. All right, and God is not putting them as in a good eye. They're only putting the ones in a good eye as when this North countries, this alliance that comes together, that's going to destroy Babylon. Okay, now notice what it says. Their arrows shall be as of a mighty man that maketh childless. You know, when I thought of the arrows, the first thing that came to my mind may not look like an arrow, but was nuclear bombs. Well, ironically, then I ran across this particular article here automatic atomic archive.com broken arrows nuclear weapon accidents since 1950 there have been 32 nuclear weapon accidents known as broken arrows a broken arrow is defined as an unexpected event involving nuclear weapons that result in the accidental launching detonating theft or loss of the weapon to date six nuclear weapons have been lost and never recovered well, what do you know? So when we think then of arrows, biblically speaking, and even according to modern terminology, U.S. military calls it arrows. So if the prophecy in, in, in Jeremiah chapter 50 is that they're going to throw their arrows at you, and it does seem like there's definitely going to be a nuclear war. And, and let me tell you something. President Putin has made it very clear, especially during the, uh, the, the Ukrainian crisis, Crimean crisis. President Putin in the documentary Crimea, The Way Home, stated in there that if he cannot win a ground war, he will use nuclear weapons. And he has just begun to test the Satan II. The Satan II is a nuclear missile. It was successful. It was tested on October the 27th, or maybe it was the 28th, I forget which day. It was tested successful in Russia, carries up to 15 nuclear warheads and can destroy the area the size of the state of Texas. You know, friends, I love you. I don't want to be a fear monger by saying these things. Only thing I can say is we need to pray. We need to seek Yeshua, Jesus, our Messiah, like never before. You got friends and loved ones that don't know Yeshua as Messiah. I'm encouraging you, seek Him today and really get to know Him. In fact, you know, let me tell you something. Speaking about Him being the Messiah, I need to do here on our Israeli News Live broadcast. I know it's we're, we're like a news magazine segment looking at prophecy and how it deals with with you know the news and biblical prophecy and how they go together, but I need to come in here and really share with you guys some incredible revelations that the Lord has given me, especially for my Jewish brothers and sisters that might be listening to this broadcast, because there's some incredible things, especially in the second book I wrote, Yom Suf, uh, Israel's final exodus. It's the redemption of Israel. We need to get into that. Oh, gosh, we're running out of time So for this broadcast here. So let's get right back to it. Daniel chapter 2. Let's go into a little bit more. Verse 1, And in the second year of the reign of Nebuchadnezzar, Nebuchadnezzar dreamed dreams, and his spirit was troubled, and his sleep broke from him. Then the king commanded to call the magicians, the enchanters, the sorcerers, and the Chaldeans to tell the king his dreams. So they came and stood before the king. And the king said unto them, I have dreamed a dream. My spirit is troubled to know the dream. Then spoke the Chaldeans to the king in Aramaic, O king, live forever. Tell thy servants the dream, and we will declare the interpretation. Now, little tidbit here, little side note. You notice that it says the Chaldeans spoke to the king in Aramaic. It was not their native language. So it'd be the same thing today. If Mystery Babylon that we see in the book of Revelation and the Chaldeans, the Chaldeans and Mystery Babylon don't necessarily have the same language. Just a little thought to think about. Continuing on, and they answered the second time and said, let the king tell us, tell his servants the dream and we will declare the interpretation. The king answered and said, I know of a truth that you would gain time in so much as you see the thing is certain with me. I think the King James translates that as gone from me. Now, before we go into Habakkuk, let me show you something here. What's interesting in this case here, you have Babylon 
and you have the Chaldeans, the astrologers, the magicians, etc. All these, in other words, all these different types of religions. And what happens here with the king reminds me so much of what happens in this day that we're living in now. And I don't say, there's many good Christians in every denomination. I realize that. And I'm not here to, to, to pick on any denomination. You know, not even whether it be the Catholic people, the Methodists, the Baptists, Presbyterians, whatever you may be, whatever walk that you feel that God has led you in. God bless you and I trust that God will bless you where you are. But you have to understand though, at the same time though, in every walk, every denominational system that we have, there's always a Judas. I mean, if Yeshua himself chose 12 uh, disciples and one of them was a devil, do you think for one minute, minute there's not false anointed among you? And I think that was interesting with Nebuchadnezzar. Here he is, the Babylonian king, the representation of a, of a power of evil, and he even realizes what a true anointing is. And he knows that the Chaldeans don't really have the right anointing. Because as he said, he knows, it, you're just looking to buy time. If I tell you the dream, then you would come up with some false interpretation. And unfortunately, this has crept into the church as well, friends. And it's just really sad that it has, but it has. It's crept into the churches. And there's too many people, I see it all the time, especially online, people have a dream, oh, I'll tell you the interpretation, I got the interpretation, the gift of it. Well, like I said earlier in the broadcast here, if they have an interpretation, don't tell them the dream. Say, when you can tell me what I dream, then tell me the interpretation. That's the way to do it. Mm. We're down to about two minutes, friends, for those of you watching on World Harvest Television Network. So let's, let's go ahead and go into Habakkuk. This is the blessing. This is the meat of it. This is where it's going to get interesting. I'm going to first just read through it, and then we're going to start breaking it down. Habakkuk chapter 1. The burden which Habakkuk the prophet did see. How long, O Lord, shall I cry, and thou wilt not hear? I cry out unto thee o, of violence, and thou wilt not save. Why dost thou show me iniquity and beholdest mischief? And why are spoiling and violence before me? So that there is strife and contention ariseth. Therefore the law is slack, and the right doth never go forth. The wicked doth beset the righteous. Therefore right goeth forth perverted. Wow. Look ye among the nations, and behold... And wonder marvelously, for behold, a work shall be wrought in your days which you will not believe, though it be told you. For lo, I raise up the Chaldeans, that bitter and impetuous nation that march through the breadth of the earth to possess dwelling places that are not theirs. They are terrible and dreadful. Their law, their majesty proceedeth from them. Their horses also are swifter than leopards and are more fierce than the wolves of the desert and their horsemen spread themselves. Yea, their horsemen come from far. They fly as a vulture that hasteth to devour. They come all of them for violence. Their faces are set eagerly as east wind and they gather captives as the sand and they scoff at kings and princes are derision and to them they deride every stronghold for they heap up the earth and take it then the spirit doth pass over and transgress and they become guilty even they who impute their might unto their God. <laughs> 